This week, I want to talk about one of my absolute favorite haunted house stories, The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. This book is rightly considered a classic, but what makes me love it is how rewarding rereading it is. Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson is one of those books which I think almost everyone has heard about, knows about, especially after Mike Flanagan's brilliant Netflix adaptation a few years back, about which I'll talk a little bit later on as well. While it may seem like a straightforward gothic haunted house horror novel, I do think there's a lot more going on inside its pages than may seem apparent at first glance. So let's explore just why this book is so scary and how its terror shifts. The Haunting of Hill House is one of the most famous openings of any work of horror or suspense or maybe just modern fiction, and it gets me every time. So here we go. No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and catydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for eighty years and might stand for eighty more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wooden stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. This opening is stunning for how eerie it feels and for what it lays bare. Jackson, from the very first line, emphasizes the importance of imagination and dreaming, of fiction and fantasy, to not just humans, but anything alive, in order for us to stay alive. We cannot exist in absolute reality without losing our minds. We need to abscond into the unreal every once in a while. Hill House, however, we are told, is not sane, which means that from the beginning of this novel we should be aware that Hill House is at once a live organism, but also that it operates in absolute reality. It cannot dream, but continues to exist, with its straight walls, firm floors, and shut doors. The final line, the whatever walked there walked alone, will return towards the end of a novel in a kind of horrible echo, and it will take on a whole new meaning as we realize that Hill House's insanity is a greedy one. But moving on from the opening paragraph, We are told about a Dr. John Montague who, despite the financial and reputational costs, has rented out Hill House for the summer in order to research the supernatural. He hopes to bring a variety of guests there and to, together with them, explore the house's paranormal side, to really put down the paranormal in an academic format. He wants to prove that it's real. His offer was not received enthusiastically by most, however, and in the end he has only three guests with him. Eleanor Vance, a shy and withdrawn young woman who just wants to belong somewhere. Theodora, a free-spirited artist who thinks all of this is quite fun, really. And Luke Sanderson, the eventual heir to Hill House, whose grandmother insisted he be present and who we're told is a thief and a liar. We get introduced to these four characters, then, But our focus throughout the novel really is on Eleanor, our protagonist. She was included on Dr. Montague's list because when she was about 12, shortly after her father died, showers of rocks just unexplainedly hit her family home for a few days before equally mysteriously stopping. So she's had some paranormal experiences seemingly, and that's why Dr. Montague has invited her. Eleanor spent her entire adult life so far caring for her mother, who was severely demanding as she grew older and needed her entire attention. Eleanor has not really lived a life. Now, after her mother's death, it hasn't really gotten any better because she lives with her older sister's family, where she sleeps on a cot in the baby's room so that she can be useful, and she once again just finds herself in a position of being unloved, not having anyone to love herself, and just generally being considered of secondary importance. Dr. Montague's invitation is a chance for her to finally experience something real, 
to start a life, to go somewhere. And so she takes the car, of which, as she reminds her sister, she paid half, and drives off from the big city into the hills. Along her journey, she dreams of what her life could be like, whether maybe she could live in that little cottage guarded by two stone lions that she just saw, or whether the oleander garden she just passed is cursed and she could lift that curse one day. In a restaurant where she has a little break, she sees a little girl insisting that she will only drink milk from her cup of stars, and she secretly hopes that this little girl will never let go of her cup and of her little quirks, that she will never let the world dim her spirit. Eventually, she does reach Hill House, where a curmudgeonly and honestly quite rude caretaker, Mr. Dudley, lets her in. Her first impression of the house is that it is vile. And she honestly kind of wants to turn back straight away, but how could she explain taking the car and leaving her sister? So she settles in, even if Mrs. Dudley is equally unwelcoming as her husband. She keeps telling Eleanor that they refuse to stay near the house during the night, which just feels quite ominous. Theodora arrives next, thankfully, and Eleanor is immediately drawn to her warmth and to her quick wit, and they vow to be friends. And this might just be the first real friend Eleanor has ever made in her entire life, but definitely her adult life. She does tell Theodora that she lives in a lovely little apartment, which is a lie, but thankfully Dr. Montague and Luke arrive quickly, and now they all settle down for dinner. It is now Dr. Montague's task to explain the house's history and why he has chosen it for their kind of project and for their stay. He's a bit reluctant to do so because all of the previous tenants have died. The last one was crushed against the oak tree in the driveway by his horse, for example. But he also tells us about the house's original builder, Hugh Crane, who built it for his family, but sadly his wife never made it because she died in a carriage accident in the driveway. He did live there with his two daughters, and he was rather unhappy there, considering his wife died just outside the door. And his two daughters spent almost their entire life fighting over the ownership of the house, which also ended in tragedy and death. On that cheerful note, they have their first evening and they settle down, and friendships are kind of starting to develop. You do have a little bit of a sense that they're building up a family unit. These four guests of Hill House also start experiencing strange things from the very start. See, Hugh Crane built the house in such a way that it doesn't really make sense. It almost feels like a maze running in concentric circles and they all have difficulty making their way around. Add to that that Eleanor and Theodora keep hearing loud banging on the doors of their bedrooms and they can feel a cold breeze creep in as well. But this is nothing compared to what Luke finds written in chalk on the walls one day. In all caps, it reads, Help Eleanor, come home. Each of these events, rather than bringing the group together, makes them a little suspicious of Eleanor. I mean, why is this message directly addressed to her? Even Eleanor is starting to wonder if the house seems to be targeting her, and honestly, she is quite frightened. While Dr. Montague assures everyone that ghosts and the paranormal cannot cause actual physical harm, that only fear can cause them harm, the two women aren't so sure. One night the banging on the walls ratchets up in intensity and the cold air is back and by now Theodora has joined Eleanor in bed, terrified. Eleanor holds her hand tightly, eyes shut until the banging leaves, but then she hears Theodora's voice from the other side of the room, so whose hand has she been holding? There's also an episode where Theodora and Eleanor take an evening stroll and seem to witness a family picnic taking place in full daylight, even though it's night. Theodora also sees something and tells Eleanor to run and not look back, and she's absolutely terrified. Many of these events are kept kind of vague, because none of the characters seem entirely sure of what it is that they're witnessing. Not because Jackson is trying to cop out, but because that is in the nature of the haunting. You're just so unsure of yourself. But sometimes Hill House also seems to be kind and maybe almost gentle, allowing for warmth, comfort and sunlight, only to rip it away straight after. Eventually, Theodora finds the words, Help Eleanor, come home Eleanor, written in blood on the walls of her own room, and she officially accuses Eleanor of making all these weird things happen in order to get attention. Eleanor is heartbroken, because she had hoped that here, 
In Hill House, with these people, she would finally find people to love and people to be loved by, a group to belong to, and now she is excluded and mocked all over again. But admittedly, Eleanor is also losing grasp of reality a little. So things are not going well for the Hill House crew, and they're about to get a little weirder, but this time because of human interference. You see, Dr. Montague has a wife, and Mrs. Montague is a parapsychologist, and she now arrives at the house with her friend Arthur. The woman is a bit cocky, and she thinks very little of her husband's academic attempts at exploring the paranormal. She's a real intrusive force, and it's only kind of once you realize how annoying she is that you also start to see how tight this group of four guests have become. They almost become like this little family against these intruders, even though the intruders are human. Mrs. Montague thinks that she herself will be the one to finally draw out and commune with whatever lives at Hill House. So she uses a planchette and says that a spirit called Nell has spoken to her, saying that she wants to go home. This, of course, gives some of the others more evidence to side-eye Eleanor, because her nickname is Nell. It also disturbs them quite a bit, though, and even though they're a little fractured, the group of four decides that this night they're going to all huddle together in what has kind of become their common room in order to keep watch. All night they hear loud banging on the doors and are terrified, only to hear the next day that Mrs. Montague and Arthur slept nearby without hearing a single thing. Aside from communing with this ghost called Nell, they haven't noticed anything weird. Eleanor, meanwhile, becomes ever more aware that she is hearing whatever is occurring in the house, even if she's somewhere else. So, for example, if Luke and Theo are having a conversation in, say, the dining room, she can hear it while being in a completely different room altogether. She starts to feel that perhaps she and the house are merging into one, she finds a strange comfort in this, even if it also scares her. One night, she wakes up and goes to the library. Eleanor is aware that something seems to be making her do that, but she also does feel a desire to follow. Then she hears her mother's voice, though, and she runs through the house trying to find her. The others now become aware that Eleanor is roaming the halls all alone, but she manages to avoid them, and it turns into something of a game for her while the others are freaking out. Eventually, she retreats to the library and climbs a very fragile iron stairway up into a turret. The others find her there and they try to get her down because they're worried that the stairway will collapse and she'll fall. Eventually, Luke manages to climb up there and just grab her and get her back down. The next morning, the others, especially Luke and Dr. Montague, have agreed that Eleanor should leave. They frame it as being for her own good, that clearly the house is getting to her and that she needs to leave for her own sake, but they do also seem to suspect that she is causing these events. Once again, Eleanor is heartbroken, and she doesn't want to leave, saying she has nowhere else to go. Theo reminds her of that little apartment that she told her about, and Eleanor admits that it wasn't real, that she made it up, and that Hill House is her only home now. This strengthens the others in their conviction that she has to leave, and so she gets in her car. As she drives down the driveway, she thinks how sad it is that the others believe they can get her away from the house, when Hill House so clearly wants to keep her. She belongs to it now. So, she puts down her foot, speeds up towards the oak tree in the driveway, getting ever closer. Moments before impact, Eleanor has one final, clear thought, wondering why she is doing this, thinking she doesn't want to do this, and asking why no one is stopping her. Her car crashes into the oak tree and she dies. The group then leaves Hill House and Dr. Montague does eventually publish his findings, but he's ridiculed by his colleagues about it. The novel's final lines are, Hill House itself, not sane, stood against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, its walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, Floors were firm and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House. And whatever walked there, walked alone. And that is The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. This novel is rightly considered an absolute masterpiece of the haunted house genre, and Jackson herself is an absolute giant in the horror and suspense genre. There's even an award named after her for outstanding achievement in the writing of psychological suspense, horror, and the dark fantastic. 
Next, I want to tell you a little bit more about Jackson herself, about my own experiences reading the book, and then about the haunted house aspect itself. Shirley Hardy Jackson was born in 1916 and became involved with her university's literary magazine while studying at Syracuse University. There, she also met her future husband, Stanley Hyman. They moved to New York and started contributing pieces to The New Yorker, with Jackson writing predominantly fiction. Eventually, they settled in North Bennington in Vermont when Hyman started teaching at Bennington College. While there, they also had their four children, and Jackson continued to write, and she actually became the family's main breadwinner. The two were apparently also in something of an open marriage, which I don't think Jackson was very happy about. It was, I think, a way to maybe curb her husband's infidelities, but it definitely contributed to a certain strain on her life. Jackson also wrote non-fiction stories about her own life raising four children, which were published in magazines like Good Housekeeping. These and some of her other writings were later collected for Let Me Tell You, a collection of her writings, published in 2015. Jackson really made the headlines when she published The Lottery with The New Yorker in 1948, a short story which most of us probably had to read in high school, and which deserves an episode all on its own, really. No spoilers, but it was so sinister to some that over 300 letters of complaint were sent into The New Yorker. It was a hit, though, but even Jackson's parents were a little upset. <laughs> the Haunting of Hill House was published in 1959, and it was received very well. Throughout this time, she also kept writing short stories, which were equally haunting and powerful, and she also published a variety of other novels throughout her life, focusing on horror and the paranormal, but also engaging with her own mental health struggles. The novel most widely considered to be her Pièce de Résistance is We Have Always Lived in the Castle, published in 1962, which I also adore. Sadly, Shirley Jackson died due to a heart condition only three years later, at the age of 48. I wonder what else Shirley Jackson would have written had she not died so young. However, the amount of work she produced considering her short life is immense, and you could spend ages reading and rereading it all. Each time I read one of her works again, new layers of meaning are revealed to me. Jackson was a little cagey when it came to discussing her writing process, though, but there are some theories about her inspiration for The Haunting of Hill House. One is that she wanted to write a ghost story after reading about psychic researchers from the 19th century. Another says that she saw a photo of a house in a magazine and thought, that looks haunted, I can write about that. She then apparently showed this photo to her mother, who revealed that that house had been designed by Shirley Jackson's great-great-grandfather, who was an architect. This personal connection would have then inspired her to write The Haunting of Hill House. Jackson herself also wrote later on about how she crafted Eleanor's journey from the big city to Hill House, how she planted little symbols like the stone lions, the oleander trees, and the cup of stars along this journey to show how Eleanor moves away from the harsh, everyday kind of drudge of a big city life to a more vulnerable, dreamlike state in which she then enters Hill House. If you're interested in a bigger discussion around her writing, but also that article she wrote describing her own process, check out the two episodes about this novel on the Lit Century podcast, where they have Benjamin Dreyer on as a guest, who is an editor and who worked on the Let Me Tell You collection. I spoke about how this novel rewards free reading at the beginning, and I want to come back to that. I first read this novel in 2016, when I was in serious need of distraction, and I immediately loved it. For me, it was a great horror book, with its hauntings being just the right mix between scary and vague, so that my brain could fill in uh, all the gaps with things that scared me the most. I also loved the tension between Eleanor and the other guests, her tragic backstory, and the looming presence of the house. It spoke to me then, when I was an adorable 24-year-old, as a relatively straightforward, if ingeniously written book. Then in 2018, Mike Flanagan's Netflix adaptation came out, and loving the book, I dove straight in. In his adaptation, Flanagan makes a family out of all the characters, who then move into Hill House in order to renovate it and sell it on. Repairs take longer than expected, however, and strange things start happening. The series flashes back and forth between the children's childhood in the house, hinting at a major tragedy about to occur, and their current lives later on, which are all defined by this unspeakable thing that happened. 
the Netflix show is very much about family, about home and about love. While it's not technically a true adaptation in the sense that the story and the characters are very different, I would say that it is absolutely loyal to certain themes of the novel, and it is a brilliant adaptation for a new age, which tells a new yet familiar story. With the show, I gained a new appreciation of how deep Jackson's work is, because it has room for an adaptation like this, which differs so much, and yet finds new ways of bringing the novel's themes to a new audience. Then in 2021, and this might be a little personal, but I found myself in a place where I wasn't entirely comfortable within myself, within my place in life at that point, and where my anxiety was sort of skyrocketing and I didn't really have a grip on it. For some reason, this found me reaching for the audiobook of The Haunting of Hill House, narrated wonderfully by Bernadette Dunn. And with a few extra years and a completely different outlook on life, the novel hit me like a freight train. <laughs> While it was still an exciting book, it touched me in a completely different way. Suddenly I was a lot closer in age to Eleanor, and I began to understand her character in a new way. Eleanor's alienation from the world, the way in which her personality has been stunted by the role she's been forced or chosen to take on within her family, the desperation with which she clings to human connections and how she kind of breaks them and damages them through that desperation, her simultaneous horror and relief at being claimed by the house because at least she finally belongs somewhere, and her final flash of self-awareness seconds before she wrecks that car, it all absolutely broke my heart. While I've never been subject to hauntings in a messed up house, I have felt something of the alienation and disconnect which Eleanor experiences, and that time reading it, the novel became a tragedy for me. It is no longer merely an exciting tale of knockings on walls and potential ghosts. It is a story, as the opening lines suggest, about what happens when we can no longer dream of a brighter future, of other options, of something comforting. And if instead we find ourselves in a stark reality which slowly twists our understanding of that reality itself. Now that I'm a bit more secure in myself again and have learned how to manage my anxiety better, it no longer hits me quite as hard, but the novel still fills me with a deep sense of melancholy. Not many novels are big enough, not in a page count sense, but in a story sense, I think, to allow their readers to grow that way, to develop new insights and new perspectives. What I'm also appreciating about the novel more and more is just the skill of Jackson's writing, the way she lures you in, how she establishes the house's disconnect, how she builds up her characters and how she maintains tension throughout the story. I've also come to appreciate the character of Theodora or Theo more. On my first reading, my focus was very much on Eleanor and Theo is just so much more alive than her that I felt a little defensive of poor little Nell. Theodore has often been read as a queer character, which I believe is the correct reading, and various adaptations have made this more or less clear. Over time, I began to recognize the ways in which Theodora too is under pressure, how her bright and brash personality is as much a defense mechanism as anything else. She also struggles to exist in this world. The dynamic between her and Eleanor is a very complicated one, as Eleanor seems to develop either a crush or, well, definitely a dependency on her. Their relationship has taken different forms and different adaptations as well, but I'm always struck by the immediacy it always has, by these two women who seem to immediately clutch onto each other amidst terrifying scenarios. And at the end, Theodora is genuinely wishing Eleanor well, and she genuinely wants her out of that situation. And I can't help but wonder what Theo's life looks like after the end of the novel. Finally, I want to briefly touch on the house itself and how it reflects some of its genre's tendencies. A haunted house story falls or stands by its haunted house. Not all haunted houses are equal, I'll tell you that for free. Hill House, however, is a real, proper haunted house because it is twisted from the beginning. Now, the first and final lines refer to how it's constructed and how technically everything seems to be as it should be. And yet the house is a manic maze of twisting corridors which seem to be off-center and it changes depending on characters' perspectives. Now, in horror, we often get references to non-Euclidean geometry and I want to briefly touch on that. 
I do need to preface that with a comment that I'm a literary scholar and my geometrical and mathematical knowledge is garbage. I should have paid more attention in high school and maybe I should just pick up another book. But as such, I would recommend that you hit the internet or a book or a teacher to find out exactly what Euclidean geometry is and how non-Euclidean geometry differs in a technical sense. Because what I want to get into is its relation to fiction, specifically science fiction, fantasy, and horror. The idea of non-Euclidean geometry has made an appearance in a variety of works, from H.G. Wells's The Remarkable Case of Davidson's Eyes to, perhaps most famously, the work of H.P. Lovecraft. In these works, the idea of non-Euclidean geometry is used to create the sense that whatever alien other paranormal thing is occurring operates outside the laws of nature, that it has its own sense of geometry which makes it impossible for a human to fully grasp and understand it. In a sense, it is cosmic horror, of finding yourself in a place where you don't belong, which was not made for you, where down is up, left is right, and the sky is below you, and straight lines do not exist. While this may not seem super scary on the surface, each of these authors is trying to evoke a sense of complete disconnect, of disassociating from your surroundings to the point that it could make you insane. It is worth noting that non-Euclidean geometry only really became a proper field of research for mathematicians in the second half of the 19th century, when both Wells and Lovecraft were growing up and starting to write. While Shirley Jackson does not refer to non-Euclidean geometry explicitly, she is playing with the same concept when it comes to Hill House, which makes it such an effective place for a haunting. The idea of this house being off-center, built in such a way that certain doors are always falling shut, that whispers carry around in different rooms, that corridors run in concentric circles, and that certain rooms are always just located where you didn't expect them. All of this conveys the sense that Hill House is indeed not sane, and that, by extension, it is alive and messing with you. While this, again, seems straightforward and you're like, yeah, of course, that's what I would expect, it creates a complete lack of trust for both your environment and your own senses. And it would lead to a very deep feeling of dread, I think, which is most definitely terrifying. Hill House would make you question everything you see, know, and hear. And we cannot exist in a state like that for very long. Hill House also becomes stranger the more the characters seem to lose faith in each other and in their project. Yubi Chamatek has written an excellent article on this called The Architecture of Evil, a great title, H.P. Lovecraft's The Dreams in the Witch House, and Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, to which I'll link in the description. Now those are some of my thoughts, as well as my personal connection to Shirley Jackson's novel. It is a stunning book, and because it is in public domain, literally nothing is stopping you from finding a copy of it on Project Gutenberg and diving in. If you do, I'd love to know what you think. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.